Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, July 25th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Washington, D.C. Renato today had an interesting diary about how Uber drivers are being defrauded via social engineering. A lot of uh, these social engineering tricks are really what we are seeing being used these days. So even if you're not an Uber driver, not associated with Uber, it may still be interesting to see through what lengths social engineering attacks go in order to defraud their victim. The attacker in this case will require request a ride via the Uber app. When you request a ride via Uber, you'll receive contact details for the driver to contact the driver even through the Uber app without having to reveal your own caller ID. Now in this particular case, the hacker takes advantage of this feature and calls the driver claiming to be an Uber representative because the call will arrive through the Uber app in this case. The driver somewhat trusts the origin of the call and to further authenticate, the caller will then claim that, well, they of course know what customer the driver is supposed to pick up, but uh, the hacker will tell them that another driver will take care of uh, this particular pickup. They first need to fix that particular driver's account in order for the driver to be properly credited for their Uber work. So this is where the attack then starts for real. The caller will ask the driver for an email address. Then to further authenticate the driver, the caller claims that they will send an SMS message to the driver's phone. What's actually happening now is that the caller will do a password reset on that email address. Many email services, of course, will authenticate the password reset via an SMS message. Message. So the caller just asks the driver for whatever code they received, will of course acknowledge that this code was correct and then use it in order to reset the driver's email password. Now the way Uber works is that drivers are being paid whenever they reach a certain threshold on a particular day. What the attacker does next is that they're using access to the driver's email address in order to to reset the driver's Uber password and with that they can change the destination of the next payment. I'm not sure if this is true for all countries in which Uber operates or just in Brazil where Renato lives, but apparently Uber can deposit this money to prepaid credit cards. So the attacker now just uses a random prepaid credit card in order to have that money deposited to that account effectively stealing at least uh, this day's earnings from the driver. And of course, the driver will probably not notice that anything went wrong until the next day. And at that point, it's probably too late to reclaim the money. Defending against attacks like this, of course, is quite difficult uh, because there aren't really any standards how to mutually authenticate for a phone call like this. And as a result, uh, the victim, in this case, the driver, doesn't necessarily know what to expect when Uber calls them. Best defense here is probably uh, to have very clear expectations as to how these calls work, how they are authenticated. But uh, then again, Again, actually applying this in real life while you're in a rush to pick up the next customer could be quite difficult. And back in January, Malwarebytes wrote about a new strain of Mac malware. At least it was new to Malwarebytes at the time called Fruitfly. The malware was basically spyware. It took screenshots, locked keystrokes, and essentially allowed the attacker to monitor the victim's activity. The malware was not widely spread and it was believed that it was already in use for about two years. That's why I say it was new at the time to Malwarebytes at least. That often happens uh, with malware that is in limited distribution and it takes a while for researchers to pick up on it. 
Now, more recently, Patrick Wardle, who develops security tools for the Mac, uh, came across a new version of this intriguing malware. He calls it FruitFly 2. And interestingly, Patrick did not run the malware in an isolated lab, but instead actually registered some of the command control domains that the malware tried to reach out to, which hadn't been registered yet. Now, having registered these domains and having them point to public web servers, not only allowed him to observe how his particular sample worked, but also other infected systems started to connect to his test system. During his investigation, he found that around 400 different victims reached out to his test systems. So certainly not a large outbreak, but still somewhat significant to have 400 infected victims. It is not really clear how FruitFly actually infects these systems and how these systems are selected, whether or not this is a more targeted attack. And then we got a new exploit that was released for Citrix's Netscaler SD-WAN. It does affect version 9.1.2. Now, Citrix did release version 9.2, which is more recent and should have this vulnerability fixed, but I couldn't really find any confirmation of that on Citrix's site. The CVE number for this vulnerability is 2017-6316 exploitation is trivial it's a remote code execution does not require authentication and provides full access to this particular device which usually operates as a virtual machine now all you have to do in order to exploit this vulnerability is embed the command that you would wish to execute on that device as part of the cgi session cookie so really easy and like i said an exploit a metasploit module has been released to take advantage of this vulnerability. So if you're using SD-WAN, uh, then uh, make sure that you check with Citrix that you're safe if you run the latest version. Well, and that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.